Well, good morning, Heritage Church. It's so good to see all of you here, all you beautiful people. If you're our guest here this morning, we're so honored that you've chosen to worship with us. We know that you have many choices and places to worship, and we're so glad that you're with us. If you would, on your way out, we have a reception room. It's the, the kind of the room to your right as you come in the door. And in there, there's some shelving, and it has some T-shirts on it. Please grab a free T-shirt from us to you just as a small gift of saying thank you for being here. All of you, when you came in, you were handed a connection card. This is your communication card with us. And if you turn to the part that says connect card, if you'd be so kind just to fill out the information that you're comfortable with, you'll drop it in the bucket at the end of our service. It has a place where if you need some information about something, you can check that and we'll email you and let you know. Um, I hear some of you tearing already. Good job. It has a place where you can leave comments. It has a place for signups and it has a place for prayer requests. Our prayer list is sent out on Thursdays in our online newsletter and we are faithful faithful to pray over those needs. So today we kick off a brand new series entitled The Table. And today we're going to talk about what Jesus's table looks like. But I want to kind of let you know what's coming up because I know you're going to want to mark your calendars and make sure you're here. Next week we're going to talk about the family table. When you gather around the family, what, what that, what God would have that to look like. The week after that we're going to talk about how that there should always be seats at the table. What are the seats that are around the table? And on the last week we're going going to take a look at what will the table look like once we leave this life and go into heaven? What will the heavenly table look like? You heard in our announcements that we are having the Surviving the Table uh, little real-life workshop thing coming up on Thursday night. If you'd like to sign up for that, please do. But I also want to call attention to something in your announcement sheet. We're having an event called Gather Around the Table. And gather around the table. We're going to have it at a local restaurant in town on November the 19th. Space is limited, so make sure you sign up. And also, if you sign up, make sure you're coming because you don't want to keep someone else from being able to go. But we're going to gather just as a group of people and share a meal together and have a fun night out. And we hope that uh, you will be a part of it. You know, the table is something that's very, very important in our lives. And this month, more than any month, because what month is it? Thanksgiving. And at Thanksgiving, you know, the table is kind of it's kind of central to our Thanksgiving celebration, the table. But if we think about it, in our lives, the table is central. And even in the cultures all around the world, the table is very, very central to what people do. Now this morning you see this beautifully decorated, isn't that beautiful? I have to tell you, a, a, a woman in our church named Terry did this for us, and she, Terry would hate if I if I mentioned her name. But what a beautiful thing! And we had had the picnic tables, and she kind of came in here for and worked for a while. And she said, "Well, come see it, see what you think about it." And and you know, all the staff, we came in here and we looked at it, and we just kind of sat down around the table, right? I mean, don't don't some of y'all just want to come sit? I mean, wait, bring me some food, right? I mean, this is this is all set and all ready to go. And it just kind of made me think a little bit about all the tables that I have been privileged to sit around. You know, one of my first memories of table would be sitting around my grandmother's table. Do you all remember those granny tables? The tables where you couldn't actually eat at the table because what did grandma use the table for? I mean, she used the whole table. Right? What, what was all over the table? The food from one end to that. My grandma was a southern grandma. So the food was all there, and we'd all have to sit in our chairs and use our lap as our table because Granny filled the whole table. I think about the table that I sat around with my siblings as kids, with my brother and my sister, and how they would smack their cereal. Did y'all have anybody that smacked their cereal in the morning? And I'd be like, stop smacking your cereal. I remember that table. I remember that the tables that I set around, those squeaky little metal chairs in the lunchroom. Do y'all remember those tables? I think about the tables in college where I thought I was so hip and I was so cool sitting at the coffee shop, you know, studying, thought I had it all figured out. And I remember the very first table I ever purchased. And let me tell you, I was excited about it and I was appalled at the cost because it was like $79.99. Can you believe that? for a table, but you got to have a table in your first apartment, right? You're not a real adult until you buy your own toilet paper, right? And until you have a table, right? 
So I had this table, and then I think about our table where our daughter grew up. I can think about her sitting in her high chair and watching her grow into a middle schooler where she struggled, you know, as many middle schoolers do with who and what she was, and then growing into this beautiful high school girl, going off to college and coming home on the weekends, and we would gather around the table, and it was just so beautiful. And, and now, then she finally, you know, she moved out, she got married and all that, and now at our table, while our table is empty most evenings with Michael and I, there's this cute little grand baby who comes over and we and she's got a space at the table too and if we think about our lives it's just table after table after table and so what I'd like for you to do right now if you're sitting by yourself you can move if you're sitting by yourself don't bother you've got your connection card you can write it on there I want you to share with somebody just for a few minutes I want you to talk I want you to share with somebody a table you remember What's a table in your life that you remember? Are you ready? This is the interactive portion of the service. You get to talk to each other. One, two, three, go. Just another minute. You know, if I had you do like I did and really think about it, you would probably be able to name tables all over the place. And that's a conversation that you can, t- can continue later on. And, you know, if we think about the table when we gather, and, and maybe, you know, one of the most important things around the table, you know, it's, it's not the food. You know, and it's not the fact that we're eating. In many ways, um, what happens around the table are the conversations that take place around the table. Because if, if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of our lives happen around tables. And so this morning, we're going to spend some time looking at the Gospel of Luke. Now, does anyone in here like to eat? Oh, okay, a few of you, a few of you. Yeah, some of y'all are just owning it. Yeah, you know, you like to eat. And if you like to eat... Luke is the gospel for you. Because in the gospel of Luke, Jesus is either leaving a meal or Jesus is either going to a meal. I mean, his dinner calendar is very, very full in the gospel of Luke. So much so that his enemies, you know what they call him in the gospel of Luke and in other places. But in Luke, they refer to Jesus as a glutton. Like he's always eating. And in Luke chapter 7, Jesus even says this. He says, the son of man came eating and drinking. Don't you love that about Jesus? I mean, he's 100% human, but he's, and he's 100% God, but he knows what it's like to eat and have a good meal and sit around the table with people. I love that about Jesus. So in the Gospel of Luke, we learn some things about Jesus. We learn that at Jesus' table, he's always present. We learn at the table, Jesus is a servant. We learn that Jesus welcomes everyone, and Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God. And so what I've done all week, I have spent all week in the Gospel of Luke, and I have been reading about meal after meal after meal of Jesus. And, 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 and Luke's not playing with this. It's not just one or two. There are 19 meals in the Gospel of Luke, and 13 of them are unique to the Gospel of Luke. So this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to go on a journey together. Will you come with me on a journey this morning? Because I'm excited about it, and I hope you'll be excited. I hope you'll open your uh, mind to what I'm going to share with you this morning. I hope you'll open your heart to what it must be like to sit at the table of Jesus. Together, we're going to get to know Jesus better when we think about what does Jesus offer us at his table. And the first thing that Jesus offers us at his table is connection. You see, we're all looking for a place to belong, a place where things 
feel like we are at home. And in this particular story that we're going to look at, Jesus has gone over to Levi's house for dinner. And Jesus is just enjoying dinner, and as often the case, a lot of the people who were, you know, who were questioning him, they asked Jesus this question, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Because at that time, all the holy people were just supposed to be with the holy people, right? They didn't hang out around with all the riffraff, right? So they asked Jesus, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You see, this little piece of scripture lets us know that Jesus desires to connect with all of us with every single one of us. You know, uh, you think about, remember when you were a kid and some of you who are still in school, you know, there are kids every day in our schools who sit at a lunch table in fear or feel very alone and no one's there for them at that lunch table. Have you ever thought about the tables that exist at the downtown rescue mission and the homeless people who gather there to share a meal? What about the tables of those who are in prison? And they gather around those, you know what? Jesus would sit at every single one of them. Jesus would be the first one to go sit down with that kid who doesn't have anyone to sit with in elementary school or middle school or high school. Jesus would be the very first one to sit with that homeless person and share a meal. Jesus would be the very first person to sit with some in prison and share a meal with them. He would do that because Jesus wanted to connect. You see, at Jesus' table, it's a no matter what table. No matter what, you are invited to this because Jesus invites you to be a part of his table. You see, at the table of Jesus, we find connection, but we find so much more. At the table of Jesus, we find this wonderful gift, the gift of forgiveness. You ever done anything wrong? Doesn't it feel great when someone forgives you from that? At the table of Jesus, we can fill up on his Jesus. In our next story of Jesus being at a table, Jesus is at a a table. He's with a a bunch of these Pharisees, these rule followers, and he's with them, and they're having this meal. And this woman comes in, and she has the nerve to interrupt the meal. And she goes over to Jesus, and she's brought some really, really expensive perfume. And she goes over to Jesus, and she proceeds to wash his feet. That was a big deal to them in their culture, that they would be clean while they shared. And, you know, they wore sandals, so their feet were often dirty. And she comes to wash it with this expensive perfume. And she is filled, just filled with remorse and regret for the things she's done. She begins to weep. The scriptures tell her that her tears were falling on his feet. And you know what the other people at the dinner party do? They make fun of her. They mock her, and they ridicule. And Jesus says this. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. You ever thought about when you gather around the table, you know, maybe when you were younger and some of you may have argued with your siblings and stuff and maybe you told your brother he was a big fat booty head, right? And when you would call him that, right, what would your parents say? Your parents would say, you need to tell your brother you're what? Sorry. And at the tables that we have sat around, we have learned what it means to extend forgiveness and what it feels like to receive forgiveness. And the forgiveness that Jesus offers to our table it, it's just, it's all, you know, everything. He's got it av- available to us at all times. The forgiveness reigns. Jesus doesn't care how many times you've messed up, how many times you've fallen short. There is always a seat at the table. Jesus always has this table set for you. And all you have to do is show up and take your place at the table. Because at Jesus' table, we find forgiveness. But at Jesus' table, we also find provision. Jesus has gone, he's out with his disciples and he's gone out and he's been teaching a lot and all these people are following because he's the greatest teacher of all time. I mean, no one ever falls asleep when Jesus is talking, right? That's what I'm thinking. No one falls asleep. He's been at this place. There's 5,000 people there and maybe you've heard the story and the disciples come to, you know, the people have been there for hours and all day long and their stomachs are growling and the disciples come to Jesus and they go, hey, we need to send these people out of here. They like need to get out of town. They need to go somewhere. They need to find some food. And Jesus says this, You give them something to eat. Don't you love that the table of Jesus is a table of provision? Because Jesus always, always provides. Too many times in our lives, we don't think about all that goes into the meals that we share around the table. 
How many times have we sat down to a meal that someone prepared and not given a thought to the work that went behind putting that food there? And how many times do we sit at a meal and we never think that, you know, it costs those people something to purchase that food for that meal? It makes one of my favorite prayers that I ever hear people when they get ready to say grace before a meal. I love the people that add this phrase, and I'm sure many of you, some of you may do this, some of you may have heard people do this, but as they pray, they thank God for their food, and then they say, thank you, God, for the hands that prepared it. It's understanding you know, that the provision is occurring. And here's what you need to know. When you take a seat at Jesus' table, Jesus will always provide for you. Whatever you need, Jesus will provide it. But there is, there's something for you to consider. Jesus, Jesus will always, may not always give you what you want, but Jesus will always provide what it is that you need. Because at the table of Jesus, trust this, there's always provision. And at the table of Jesus, we discover discipleship. And what is discipleship? Discipleship is when we decide we're going to follow Jesus, we try to spend the rest of our lives trying to learn to be like Jesus. We try to model him. We're not perfect at it. We take two steps forward. We take two steps back. But that's our journey of of, of being a follower of Jesus Christ is our discipleship. And at this particular story, Jesus has gone over to dinner, to dinner to two women's house. Now, you know, what's your house like before you get ready to have company? Do things get a little, does the, does the anxiety and tension go up a little bit? Anybody ever, like, running around like a chicken, you know, with their head cut off, and the doorbell rings, and you throw something in the oven and close it because you're not using the oven, you don't want them to find it, right? I mean, all this, you know, all this, anybody, am I the only one that's ever done that? And then the next time you turn it on, it catches on fire, right? And so, uh, oh, too soon. And anyway, um, you know, um, you know, this, 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 they've come over to these two women's house and it's Mary and Martha and they've been making all these preparations. I mean, Jesus is coming to dinner. I mean, can you imagine if Jesus was coming to dinner, right? And so Jesus is coming, they're running around and Martha, you know, Martha's like, you know, man, I'm working so hard and my sister. And the minute Jesus hits the door, Mary, peace out. You know what Mary does? She goes over and she sits down at the table at the feet of Jesus. And Martha is not happy about it. Any of y'all, when you're upset, everybody knows it, right? I mean, everybody knows it, right? Martha is not happy. And uh, she lets it be known that she's not happy with her sister. And it says that Jesus said this. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. You know, I think about all the tables that I've sat around and all the lessons that I've learned around the tables. I mean, I've learned, you learn something almost every time you sit down with a meal and share a meal with something. You learn something, and as kids, our parents use that table time to teach us the lessons that we needed so that we would have a good life. And so, you know, I can remember my dad, my dad had this saying, and, 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 I, and, and I remember it, you know, this is my dad's saying. We'd sit around the table, my dad would always say this, nothing good ever happens after midnight, right? Nothing good ever. And to this day, to my horror, you remember when you're young, you're like, I'm never going to talk like my parents did, and I'm never going to use those sayings that they did. And the first time they come out of your mouth, you're like horrified, right? Because you said, you're like, oh my gosh, I sound like my what? My mother, right? But that happens to us, you know, as as we learn things around the table. And around the table of Jesus, Jesus is patient with us, and Jesus is teaching us how to follow him. Too many of us, we think that we can't be the follower of Jesus that we want to be because we don't know enough. We don't know enough Bible. We don't pray enough. We're not good enough. All the things that keep us from doing what Mary did. You see, Mary sat at the table, and she sat at the feet of Jesus. And if we would spend time with Jesus, we will grow as followers of Jesus. You see, at the table of Jesus, we'll always find our discipleship. And then at the table of Jesus, this would probably be our least favorite. At the table of Jesus, we're going to find some accountability. We're going to be held responsible for this life, this one precious life, that God has given us. And in this particular story, Jesus has gone over to one of the Pharisees' house. Remember, they're the rule followers. And Jesus, as he's going in, Jesus uh, gets called out. Now, doesn't that take, that's kind of cheeky, right, to call Jesus out, right? 
And so Jesus is sitting down at this meal, and Jesus gets called out on his table manners. Kind of like maybe your mom would say, get your elbows off the table. Jesus is getting called out on his table manners. And Jesus is called out because he didn't wash his hands by this Pharisee. And so Jesus replies. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. I mean, if you think about it, you've sat around some tables where you've been held accountable. And around those tables, you know, with those people that you trust and people that you know, a lot of times they'll just tell it. You ever heard anybody in your life that just tells it like it is? And they, you know, kind of look at you face to face and they tell you um, something to hold you accountable. And you know what's beautiful about that is they feel somewhat like they have a responsibility to you. They want to be in relationship to you. They care that much. You know, if you want to practice accountability around your own table, a practice that we had growing up when our daughter was growing up, we did something called highs and lows every night. We would say, what was the high? What's the best thing that happened in your day? And your low? What's the worst thing that happened in, in, in your day today? that's a great way to be able to hold people accountable you see at the table of jesus we'll be held accountable you know jesus knows what our cups look like we can polish it all up we can put on the right clothes we can put on the right smile you know we can hold it in we can fake it we're, we're really really good at that but jesus knows what's going on inside of us we can never hide from god see at the table of jesus There's also accountability. And at the table of Jesus, we find invitation. Jesus was the master, the master of hospitality. Have you ever gone over to someone's house for dinner and they have got it going on? I mean, you go back to your house and you're like a little embarrassed and you're feeling like you need to redecorate and you don't have the right dishes. Anyone ever done that? I mean, you just go home and you're just like, oh my goodness, what are we doing? We're eating off Dixie plates every week, right? I mean, what are we doing? There's some, some people just have that gift and Jesus is the author of the gift of hospitality. So Jesus is talking to some people, and at, at, at this, you know, he's telling them about how to, how, to, how to throw a dinner party, how to do it. And, you know, all the religious people, they're always all together. And then Jesus blows their mind when he says this. When you give a feast, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame, and invite the blind. You see, Jesus' invitation is open to all You know, we think about our own hospitality uh, in our midst, you know, hospitable, where we always talk to you about, y'all have heard this phrase before, who are you investing in? Who are you inviting? Who are you including? The reason we do that is because Jesus tells us to go out and find those people. And a lot of times we act like we have a wonderful guest services team, and our guest services team, they're the ones who greet you, open the doors, usher, all those kind of things. But, but, But here's the deal. They're not the only ones on the guest services team. When I taught school, I taught reading. And every year, of course, reading teacher scores are looked at very harshly, much like math teachers' scores are looked at very roughly. But the science and social studies people, they kind of get like a little break on all that. And I can remember one of them saying one time, well, I don't teach reading, you do. I was like, no, 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 no. We all teach reading, the math teacher. How can you solve a word problem if you can't read, right? Um, How can you, you know, find the coordinates on the map if you can't read what it's asking for? How can you do that in social studies? We're all reading teachers together. And here's the deal when it comes to hospitality, not just in our church, but in the world around us. But every person every day is on the hospitality team. Every person every day. When we walk through the doors here, it's it's not the greeters. You don't walk in and go, oh, it's not my week. No, 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 no. We're all here to show the hospitality of Jesus Christ. I want you to look at the people that Jesus invites. You know, they're people. They don't look like me. They don't look like you. They um, might believe differently. They might live differently. They might have had different struggles. But at Jesus' table, his table is open to all. And what does the word all mean? All. Everyone is welcome at Jesus' table because Jesus' table is a table of invitation. And then how exciting. Jesus' table is a table of salvation. And, uh, you know, Jesus was out one day and he was speaking. And whenever Jesus was speaking, all the crowds would just swarm around him. And he's walking through and he's just kind of looking. And he sees this guy up in a tree. And he tells the guy, the guy's name was Zacchaeus. He says, you need to come on and get down out of this tree. And so the guy gets down the tree. And you know what Jesus did? 
that thing that we can't stand. Jesus invited himself over for dinner. You ever been to somebody invite themselves over to dinner? Like Jesus invited himself over for dinner. And so Zacchaeus goes, well, you know, come on. So they go to his house. And while he's there sitting at the table of Jesus, something changes in his heart. His heart that had been hardened, his heart that had been hurt by the world, something changed. And he moved from skepticism and disbelief to just open willingness, just an open heart to accept the salvation of Jesus Christ. And he had a conversion that day. And his conversion was big. It wasn't a mini conversion. Have you ever met somebody that met Jesus Christ and, and a few days later you're like, holy cow, calm down, right? Right? I mean, he, I mean, he is, his, he, he, had been a, he had been a tax collector and he had taken people's money and he collected it and all these kind of things, okay? So he has this, he comes to Jesus' table, he sits down, he discovers who Jesus is and when he does, he says, you know what? He said, I give half my money, half my money to the work you're doing. Uh, none of us, you know, who, who would do that, right? And then he says this, and he says, and if there's anybody that I've hurt, if I've hurt anybody, I will give, I will repay them four times over. I won't just pay them back. I'll repay them four times over. What a conversion that was. You see, uh, for most of us, when it comes to this, you know, we have to think that, um, you know, what is it like to experience the salvation of Jesus Christ? Jesus comes into our lives at the table. And it's at the table where we, as family members and friends, for people who don't know what it's like to come to the table of Jesus, this is where we teach on salvation. So I have to ask you, how graceful is your table? How much mercy is there at table, at your table? How much forgiveness do people experience at your table? Because, you see, you represent you represent Jesus, and at every table you gather, there's a component of Jesus being present. And think about the table of Jesus. Jesus' table is like this buffet. It makes what my granny put out look like small fry. I mean, it's a big deal. It's spread from one end to the other, and it's for all people. And at his table, there's unconditional love. There's acceptance. There's joy, and there's peace. You see, at the table of Jesus, that's where we find salvation. This world, you can eat all you want. You can gorge yourself on all the things of the world, and I promise you, it will never fill you up. It'll never be enough. You'll eat, and you'll be hungry. You'll drink, and you'll be thirsty. But when you come to Jesus' table, that's where you will experience salvation. Because at the table of Jesus, that's where we find it. And then at the table of Jesus, we find gratitude. And what a great thing to think about. It's November. And isn't it sad that for a lot of us, the only times we think about being grateful is in November when every breath we take is a gift from God. Every moment we spend with somebody we love is a gift from God. Every sunset, all those things, beautiful things. What happen if we could live our lives full of gratitude? And so in this particular story, Jesus is gathered with his disciples. We just said these words last week when we shared Holy Communion. And Jesus is gathered with his disciples. And Jesus says to them that this is the last meal that he's going to eat until after he come, returns in his resurrection. So he tells them that. And as they're eating the meal, Jesus takes the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. Isn't it interesting that the creator of the universe models for us that we are supposed to be grateful? Jesus didn't have to say thank you for the bread, but he took that bread and he gave thanks. And that ought to cause some reflection for us. How many things in our lives do we take for granted? I mean, we take things for granted. We think take people for granted. And we take God for granted. But our God wants us to live a life of gratitude. If you sit here this morning and the world is weighing you down and you feel unhappy and you feel overwhelmed, part of the answer is to begin to live a life of gratitude. And at the table of Jesus, you will always find that gratitude. And then at the table of Jesus, we remember this is when Jesus appears to his disciples 
after after he had been crucified and after at the resurrection he appears to them and isn't it interesting in the gospel of luke when he appears to them he's going to appear with appear to them at a what table and our scripture tells us this when he was at the table with them he took the bread and broke it and blessed it and gave it to them their eyes were open and they recognized him. They did not recognize him until he broke the bread. You see, it's at the table that we remember. You know, I've, I went, when, you know, I grew, grew up in a, in a world in which I moved around a lot. And so family reunions were kind of rare for me. But when I married Michael, Michael has this crazy, bizarre, mixed up, crazy family. And they have these crazy family reunions and in multiple places and stuff. But, but when we gather for those family reunions, you know what? I'm part of something there. And I remember who, who I am and, 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 and where, where I'm going in those things. And those family reunions, you know, when you gather with your family at Thanksgiving, do you you kind of remember who you are and you remember where you're going and where you've come from but see when we gather at the table of Jesus that's where we remember whose we are we remember that we are Jesus's children that we are part of Jesus's family scripture tells us nothing can separate us from that we believe we're part of the family. We're welcome at the table, and we can experience the unconditional love of God. And that love is the love that heals any brokenness that we carry around with us. And that love is found for all of us at the table. You know, when you look at the table of Jesus... You see, there are so many things that Jesus offers us at this table. And doesn't it make you kind of sad that this beautiful table that Jesus has set is available for us all the time, and so many times we don't even bother to take a seat. But at the table of Jesus, that's where we're going to find what will satisfy our hearts. At the table of Jesus, we'll discover connection. At his table, we'll find invitation. At Jesus' table, we'll find forgiveness and salvation and discipleship. There'll be accountability, but there'll be provision, and we'll be able to live gratitude. And maybe, just maybe, most importantly, at the table of Jesus, we remember. We remember. You know, I had you all share a favorite story of a, of a table time in your life or a favorite table, and, and you may think about this as the week goes on as you look at tables, and I saved mine for last, and I just wanted to share this story with you of, of my favorite table story. So when our daughter was around seven years old, I was preparing dinner, and I was in the kitchen doing things, and she had been sitting at the table, and she had a bunch of Sharpies with her and, you know, all those kind of things. She's just kind of sitting there, and then, as kids often do, she had wandered out of the kitchen, and she had gone outside to play with her friends or whatever, and then it came time that the meal was almost finished, and I was getting ready to put it on the table, and so I went over, and I began to set the table. And when I did, and I got around to kind of her side of the table, I saw where she had taken a red Sharpie, and she had just written her name in big block letters where she sits. Well, like any mom, like, what in the world, you know, did you do? And my seven-year-old looked up at me, and she said, well, she said, I didn't want you to forget me. And, you know, I looked at her, and I said, I'm your mama. I'll never forget you. What I want all of us to remember as we think about the table of Jesus, I want you to remember that your name is written on Jesus' heart, and your name will always be written on the table of Jesus because Jesus' table is a table for all of us.